What is the most important thing to manage insulin resistance? Is it eating lower carbohydrates? Is it eating less processed food? Is it exercising more? Believe it or not, it's none of those. It seems as though those things play a huge role, but looking at the large meta-analysis, looking at a, lar a lot of these large studies, we see that the amount of muscle mass that someone has, and I'm not talking big bodybuilder style muscles, I'm talking just good muscle mass, that plays a tremendous role in how our body uses glucose. And we're gonna expand and give you some things that you can do to improve how your muscle uses glucose and stores it. So let's dive in. So first, you need to think of your muscles as what is called a glucose sink. The muscles are just a place that glucose can go. It means if you consume carbohydrates, you have a place for it to go rather than it just circulating through the bloodstream. There's a study that was published in the journal Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. It took a look at over 13 thousand people. So a very large study. And it was looking at the correlation between muscle mass and insulin resistance. And they found that lo and behold, larger amounts of skeletal muscle mass were associated with lower levels of insulin resistance, lower HbA1c, and a lower prevalence of prediabetes and full-blown diabetes. They also found that there was an interesting correlation. For every 10% increase in muscle mass, there was an 11% decrease in the risk of insulin resistance. Okay, that is a pretty solid number, demonstrating the more muscle we have, we have a profound effect on our glucose metabolism and our risk of insulin resistance. So does everyone need to run out and be a bodybuilder? No, we need to focus on a few things, which we'll talk about, like vascularization, inflammatory response, so we'll dive into that a little bit more as we go. But here's an analogy to help something make a lot of sense. Think of, your circulatory system as a sink, a big kitchen sink, okay? And think of glucose as the water in that sink. Now I want you to think of muscle as a drain in that sink, okay? If you have a small amount of muscle, you only have one drain. So that sink fills up with water, and what do you know? It takes a long time for that glucose to go low because it has to go through one little teeny drain. But the more muscle you have, the more drains you have. So you build some muscle, now you have 15, 16, 17, 20 drains. Dump some glucose or some water in, it's gonna drain really fast, right? So that's the general analogy and kind of premise here. But now we have to look at what's called vascularization. Okay, what good would it be if I magically made you have a bunch of muscle right now, but you didn't have adequate blood flow to the muscle? Glucose travels through the blood. So if you have a bunch of muscle without a bunch of capillary density to deliver the blood to the muscle, you have a limiting factor there, pretty serious one. Interestingly enough, when you look at muscle cross-sectional studies and you look at the whole data, you find that a lack of capillary density or a decrease in capillary density or decrease of ultimately like vascularization, blood flow to a muscle, is an early predictor of insulin resistance. So we actually see that. People that are becoming insulin resistant have less and less capillary density, less and less vascularization in their muscles. Interestingly, there was a study that took a look at healthy subjects, had them do some specific resistance training in the quadricep muscle. They just had them train quads, kind of random. Okay, they did this for 12 weeks and they found a 17% increase in muscle cross-sectional area. But alongside that, they saw an increase in the amount of capillaries per muscle fiber. So they didn't just see a correlated increase of capillary density along with muscle growth. They saw more blood flow to individual fibers, even ones that were already there before. This is huge because it means we deliver more glucose into the bloodstream and more glucose into the muscle. The really big picture here though is the next limiting step, and that is the mitochondria. Okay, so now you have a bunch of muscle. You have a bunch of blood flow. You have a bunch of carbohydrates stored. That's great, right? But what good are those carbohydrates if you cannot ever use them? If you cannot burn them, right? So that comes back to mitochondrial function, okay, the ability to use the glucose that you've stored. And generally speaking, when you have an increase in muscle mass, you have an increase in mitochondrial density, the amount of mitochondria that goes along with it. Remember, mitochondria is where we burn fuel. So if we have more muscle, we usually have more mitochondria, more places to burn carbohydrates. Obviously a good thing. The bottom line is, can the mitochondria keep up with the extra work 
that is involved by having more glucose. And that is where potential mitochondrial dysfunction can come into play. So this is exceptionally important for people that are older, like over the age of 40. But what they did find is that in the older population, those that were insulin resistant had a 40% reduction in their mitochondrial oxidative and phosphorylation capacity. In human terms, what that means is in those subjects that were insulin resistant, they found, oh, their mitochondria does not process carbohydrates well. That's a big problem. That means that these older people had mitochondrial dysfunction. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Was the mitochondria becoming disrupted and dysfunctional and that causing the insulin resistance or is the insulin resistance causing the mitochondria to become dysfunctional? The world may never know, but it leads us to believe that that age-related mitochondrial dysfunction is really a root issue we need to be paying attention to. Here's a couple things that you can do to restore mitochondrial function, just so you have some tactical things and then we'll continue on with the rest of this video because I have a few other things to talk about. Fat, intermyocellular fat, things like that. Okay, what you can do, occasionally fast, occasionally take some time away from food, simply because it restores the mitochondria's ability to be resilient. You give your body a break from food, the stress response can allow the mitochondria to go through what's called biogenesis, so you create more mitochondria. Also, the act of autophagy through fasting can play a very big role here, okay? The combination of resistance training and cardio, Okay, building muscle by resistance training, but then doing cardio to stress the mitochondria. So what can happen is resistance training can help build more muscle and potentially give you more mitochondria, but aerobic exercise is what actually stresses the mitochondria to ultimately become more dense. Okay, it's like type one muscle fibers versus type two muscle fibers. So basically you wanna have a nice even ratio of resistance training to cardio. Cardio is not gonna burn up all your muscle as long as you are eating enough. Another thing that you can do is periodically reduce carbohydrates. Take a couple of days, you don't have to necessarily go ketogenic, but if you take a couple of days to reduce carbohydrates here and there to stress your body, it can play a big role. Another thing, cold exposure. Another thing, sauna, high heat sauna exposure two to three days per week. These kinds of things can play a very big role. And another thing that you can do is if you are gonna consume carbohydrates, consume carbohydrates literally during your workout. It sounds crazy, but that's gonna allow you to soak up those carbohydrates into the muscle even more, and it can help sort of restore that pattern so that the cells can get better at utilizing glucose. It's almost like training your cells to use glucose better. But one of the best things you can do is make sure that you are getting enough protein. Okay, the protein is what is going to allow the fruits of your labor to really be, well, flourished, right? To really ultimately grow and come to fruition. If you're not getting the protein, you're just breaking down tissue and having an inflammatory response. I always recommend getting it from Whole Foods whenever possible. I put a link down below if you like steaks, if you like chicken for ButcherBox. ButcherBox is an online meat delivery company. So they have grass-fed, grass-finished steaks like New York steaks, they have ribeyes, they have fillets, flank steaks, everything that you can think of. Plus they also have a bunch of sustainable and wild-caught seafood, a bunch of really good poultry options. Plus they're getting creative with some really cool stuff too. Best part is it's delivered to your doorstep so you're not having to spend a bunch of time going to the grocery store, dealing with all of that. It is a huge, huge, huge advantage that you can have by just being able to get it delivered to your doorstep. So that link is down below for ButcherBox. I'm telling you, it tastes delicious, and if you prioritize these kinds of food, it can make a huge difference in how you feel. So again, that link is down below for ButcherBox. Use that special link to check them out. The inflammation piece is a very important thing. As we age, there is an age-related correlation to inflammation. Now, it can be caused by a number of different things, and we'll save that for a different day. But when you have more what are called inflammatory markers, things like C-reactive protein, things like tumor necrosis factor alpha, IL-6, things like that, these are all inflammatory markers that affect something called the JNK pathway. The JNK pathway, once that is activated, that affects something called insulin receptor substrate one. Insulin receptor substrate one needs to be functioning properly. If it's not, you're disrupting the function of insulin upon a cell. So we have two issues here, the pancreas not producing insulin properly and the cell not receiving insulin properly. In this particular case, inflammation affects 
the receiving of insulin at the cellular level, and it can be pretty gnarly. There is a study that was published in the journal Experimental Gerontology that looked specifically at C-reactive protein, 13 different studies, meta-analysis, and it found that resistance training itself, the actual act of resistance training, lowered C-reactive protein as well as other inflammatory markers, meaning actually the very act of working to build muscle can actually decrease the inflammation that's associated with insulin resistance. Now let's move into how fat plays a role, because this is fascinating. If you ask some people, they're going to tell you that fat doesn't really dictate insulin resistance. It's more about carbohydrate consumption, it's more about overconsumption of food in general. But when you start looking at things and you look at these pretty detailed DEXA scan studies, it's pretty eye-opening. There was a study that was published in the journal Scientific Reports, 14,807 participants huge collective study, okay? And they used a DEXA scan to categorize people into three groups, okay? High fat, low muscle, a lot of fat, little muscle. High muscle, but low fat, so very lean people with a lot of muscle. And then people with high amounts of muscle, but also high amounts of fat. Well, guess what? If fat didn't play a role, we would see that people with high fat and high muscle would have the same result as people with high muscle and low fat because muscle is the determining factor, right? Wrong. In this study, people that had high muscle and low fat had a significantly less occurrence of insulin resistance or less prevalence of insulin resistance. Next in line, high muscle, high fat. Next in line, low muscle, high fat. Okay, so clearly fat is playing a role here. This is a large group of data here. We can't say for 100%, but something is happening here. Now, this is correlation, but when you start looking at what is called intramyocellular triglycerides, the fat that is inside the muscle, this could be impeding the whole insulin receiving and glucose metabolism. And the reason is, is because if you have more fat that is tied up into the muscle, intramyocellular triglycerides, what happens is the cells within that tissue actually start using fat. They use those intramyocellular triglycerides a little bit more, and glucose takes a back seat. So what that means is, by just nature of the body running on preferential, like preferentially what's there, it actually starts getting poor at using glucose. It's like if your body is always using fat, it's not good at using glucose. It's actually a word of caution that I give people that are doing the ketogenic diet for a long period of time. If you don't occasionally give your body glucose to use, it gets poor at using it. So high levels of intramyocellular triglycerides can actually negatively impact how your body uses glucose, therefore leading to a potential increase in insulin resistance. The interesting thing is, is there is an interesting study published in the journal Nature and Science of Sleep that demonstrated that high levels of intramyocellular triglycerides can actually improve performance in oxidative phosphorylation. So what's the deal here? Well, no one ever said that fats are a bad fuel source. So when it comes to exercise, the body's ability to utilize fats in an exercise fashion can actually be hugely beneficial. And this may actually open the door to why some people that are athletes end up having high levels of circulating glucose because their bodies are very efficient at using intramyocellular triglycerides and it could negatively impact their ability to use glucose. So what does this mean for you as a pragmatic takeaway? It means that you do need to occasionally cycle on and off of carbohydrates. You need to encourage your body to utilize carbohydrates sometimes and you need to encourage your body to utilize fat sometimes so that you are metabolically efficient and flipping back and forth between the two. That is what I would consider the fundamental laws of being, having truly strong mitochondria. Mitochondria that can use both. So the bottom line here, modulate inflammation through different pathways. Cold exposure, heat exposure, good exercise. Okay, that's gonna help you out a lot. Then of course, we're gonna pay attention to keeping ourselves as lean as possible. We're gonna eat carbohydrates only when we're active. And we're gonna have periods of fasting to restore that mitochondrial health. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.